ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What Elder Wright and Elder Cartwright did not know was when I was 16 years old, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And God spoke to this, the heart of this 16-year-old kid and said, I've seen your dreams. Give me your dreams, and I will let you glimpse a little of what I've been dreaming for you. God said, if you can just be faithful to the best of your ability, I will take your life down an unusual path. It will allow you to sing and minister to the masses. You will get a chance to speak truth to people of influence and power. And then God said, I want you to prepare to articulate the issues of religious freedom. That's what God spoke to the heart of this 16-year-old. I didn't know what it meant. Didn't realize that I would end up living everything. God showed me he was dreaming for my life. Even having served our church as the associate director for public affairs and religious liberty for the worldwide church. How do you do that? Our scripture today tells of Daniel's prophetic ministry unfolding to King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdoms he had seen in vision. He said to the king, you are the head of gold, but other kingdoms will come after yours. Kingdoms of gold silver, brass, iron, and iron mixed with clay. Nebuchadnezzar listened politely, but in defiance of the prophecy, ordered his engineers to construct a statue made entirely of gold, a statue signifying his intention to thwart and obstruct the irrepressible, ever-advancing will of God. The statue unveiled was unequaled in history, ten stories high, made entirely of gold. Upon its completion, all citizens and subjects of Babylon were summoned to come and bow down in worship before the image. The announcement was made that at the sound of the music, everyone was to fall down and worship the golden image the king had built. As the military band began to play the official hymn of the state, everyone without quarrel or hesitation bowed down to the idol. Everyone, that is, except for three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Church, I can tell you a secret. I have learned in my life that when you stand for right, you will always stand out. Some of you know I have a motto I've tried to live by in my whole life. You don't have to compromise to be recognized. While everyone was bowed down before the idol, a few members of the self-appointed worship police. (laughs) You know them, they are in every church, you know. They will sneak a peek to see who's bowing, who has their eyes still open. To their dismay and delight, they saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing ramrod tall, 
no look of fear or anxiety on their faces. And the worship police ran to the king with their report inspired of envy. O king, live forever. You know those young Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refuse to bow to your image that you have created. O king, we have it on good report that their boast is that they will not obey any command that goes against their faith and conscience. What, said the king, bring them to me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were summoned to the palace to be queried by the king. Is it true, said Nebuchadnezzar, that you will not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I've set up? Now before you answer, remember, whoever does not bow down, shall be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace. Boys, let me reason with you. (laughs) You've been a real asset to my kingdom. Just bow down and all will be forgotten. And besides, who is this God? You are expecting to deliver you out of my hands. Friends, without fear or tremor in their voices, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, O king, we have heard your decrees. We are aware of your orders. But respectfully, O king, we understand the consequences. (laughs) We've already counted the cost. No need for negotiation or special consideration. Our response is neither impulsive nor ill-considered. When it comes to the worship of our God, neither threat of fire, coercion, or duress will cause us to vacillate or equivocate. We will not bow down to the idol you have created. What insubordination, said the king. I put up with your religion all these years. I've given you your Sabbaths off. I've accommodated your vegetarian diet. I've gone along with your absence from my religious festivals, but this time you've gone too far. Soldiers, make the fire seven times hotter and feed them to the flames. We'll see if their God is able to deliver. The three Hebrew boys said, a uh, uh, point of order, O oh king, there is no if here. Our God is able. He brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea on dry land. He is able. Our God, when they were hungry in the wilderness, our people were hungry. God sent the children of Israel organic, probiotic manner. There is no if here. When they got thirsty, he turned a rock into a wellspring of clean water, sparkling, vitamin-enriched water. Brothers and sisters, many years... Anybody know that God is able? I said, did anybody here know that your God is able? I want you to know, years ago, I was flying on a private plane from Seattle to Spokane, Washington. We were coming over the Cascade Mountains. It was dark and raining, and we crashed. I've only been in one plane crash in my life. The FAA investigated and found out that the pilot had forgotten to put the wheels down. And we came in and slammed into the concrete. They said the the sparks could have ignited the fuel and sent us up in a ball of flames, but... Uh, they said that because it was raining heavily, the rain doubts the sparks that could have ignited the fuel. But that's what they said. I want you to know, my God is able. The three Hebrew boys said, King, we know our God is able to deliver, but if not, if he doesn't be it known, we will still trust him. We will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image. Nebuchadnezzar shouted, tie them up, take them away, 
Bind them like sheaves in their coats, their hats, and garments. This way they will be more combustible. Then throw them into the midst of the flames. The Bible says that the fire was so hot that those who threw them into the flames were killed. Oh, but I want you to know when the three Hebrew boys were cast into the furnace, they opened their eyes. Not only were they still alive, they found they were not alone in the fire. Praise God, the three Hebrew boys realized they had a friend in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar looked up from his royal box, his face pale, his tongue stammering. He could barely get out the words, did we not cast three men into the fire? How is it that I see four men all loose walking around in the midst of the flames? Nebuchadnezzar went, stood in front of the fiery furnace, shouted, servants! of the Most High God, come out. I want you to know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took their time, walked leisurely out of the fire. And in that moment, brothers and sisters, their friend in the fire disappeared. The king had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego examined. They had no burns, not a hair was singed. Robes had not been touched by the flames. And even more amazing, they didn't even smell of smoke. Now, I want you to know many times in my cooking career, I have burned something in the kitchen. And when I'm cooking and burn something in the kitchen, I can spray all the Febreze in the world. I can't hide that burn smell from Linda. Linda can tell right away when she walks into the house. If I burn something in her kitchen, not only were the bodies of these boys not scorched or blistered, nor their robes charred or colored, the three Hebrew boys walked out of that fire and didn't even smell of smoke. Nebuchadnezzar looked at those boys He became overcome by a spirit of praise and worship. He began to testify, what a God. What a God. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels and delivered his servants, spared and yielded their bodies. The servant of the Lord says, by the the deliverance of his faithful servants, The Lord declared that he takes his stand with the oppressed and rebukes all earthly powers that rebel against the authority of heaven. I'm going to ask him to turn up the mic just a little bit so I can back away. I don't like working it too close. And then in the midst of all this praise and worship, the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar made a terrible mistake. It is the same mistake Christians have made down through the centuries. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said in verse 29, Therefore, I make a decree that every people nation and language which speak anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. You see, church, Nebuchadnezzar's mistake was this. He used his kingly power and the power of the state to forbid anyone to speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that was a mistake. Nebuchadnezzar's mistake was that he used the power of the state to pressure and coerce all in his kingdom to show honor and worship to the God of Israel. And all who violated the will of this religio-political alliance 
were to be punished with persecution and death. They, to, they were to be cut in pieces from limb to limb. The houses were to be raised and reduced to rubble. Brothers and sisters, Nebuchadnezzar used the power of the state allied with his newfound faith to bully and intimidate others into worshiping the God of earth and heaven. The servant of the Lord says it was right for the king to make public confession and to seek to exalt the God of heaven above all other gods. But in endeavoring, in endeavoring to force his subjects to make a special, similar confession of faith and to show similar reverence, to show similar reverence, Nebuchadnezzar was exceeding his right as a temporal sovereign. He had no more right, either civil or moral, to threaten men with death for not worshiping God, then he had to make the decree consigning the Hebrew boys to the flames. God never compels the obedience of man. He leaves all free to worship whom they will serve. I want you to know, I want you to pray for me right now for what I'm about to tell you. This misguided impulse to use force to compel others to worship God has plagued the church of God for centuries. And frankly, that impulse is alive and well in America today. A recent survey of Christians following this election cycle. Lord have mercy, what a cycle. A recent survey showed that Christians in America are primarily motivated in the political arena by a desire for power and control in American society. Did you hear that? The church, the Christian church in America is primarily motivated in the political arena by a desire for power and control. Most Christians in America believe that a strong man working on behalf of the church is what this country needs to bring liberals into line. Most Christians in this country believe that what this country needs is a strong man to bring wayward progressives into line. They believe a strong man working on behalf of the church is what is needed to elevate the Christian church to its rightful place of power in America. The bottom line is, Christians in America want more political power and control. They want the Congress back. <laughs> they want the Senate back. They want the White House back. Many Christian leaders even believe they don't necessarily want or need their president to be Christ-like. One southern pastor said, and I quote him, he said, I just want the meanest, toughest SOB I can find. And I believe, he said, that that's biblical. Another pastor said, nowhere in the Bible is a government told to forgive those who wrong it. Nowhere in the Bible is a government told to turn the other cheek. Christians, he said, shouldn't care about a leader's tone or vocabulary. Woo! And he said, my leader does not have to be Christ-like. Somewhere I read that righteousness exalted the nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. God is telling us here that the righteous character of a nation is what will make it great again. By the way, only one candidate has told the Christian church, when I'm elected president, Christianity will have power again. Brothers and sisters, 
church-state alliances have never made any nation great. God has no need of state power to advance his kingdom agenda. Jesus never sought it. His true disciples never will. God's true church will always be distrustful of the trappings, symbols, and authority of the state. God never intended for the church to have state power. History has proven that when the church gets its hands on the wheel of state power, the church becomes a manipulating, tyrannical beast. I have watched over the last four decades prophecy being slowly fulfilled in America in fits and starts. The Christian church in America has been seeking the reins of state power as a way to extend the dominion of Christ over this nation. The religious teaching that has been gaining traction amongst Christians is the theology of Baxter and Calvin. The belief that God intended the world to be governed and subdued by Christians. It is an erroneous belief that God made a secret covenant with Christians to have dominion over this country. The role of the church in the public square is to witness, not to rule. How oh, did you hear me today? The role of the church in the public square is to witness, not to have dominion, it is to resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of Christ to the world. And this dream of the righteous ruling the earth and ruling this country before Jesus comes is a miserable delusion. When Nebuchadnezzar used the power of the state to terrorize and threaten other people into worshiping God, he made a new idol for them to worship. And right now, the Christian church in America doesn't realize it. But in seeking the help of the state to bring liberals to heal, they are trying to do something that is both dangerous and impossible. It is impossible. You see, listen carefully, they are trying to have religious freedom for themselves and have a Christian nation too. The truth is, you can't have both. You cannot have a Christian nation and religious freedom too. Are you listening to me? I know this is a difficult pill for some to swallow. The founding fathers understood this. They understood that democratic majoritarianism, which is what we have in this country, is a wonderful form of government. Dem democracy is a wonderful form of government. It has one fatal flaw, and that is the will of the majority, no matter how slim, takes priority and marginalizes the minority and even the moral objections of the righteous. And yes, even the majority can get it wrong. When it comes to minorities, the majority is seldom magnanimous and gracious. They are usually fearful and distrustful. That's why the First Amendment, Amendment to the Constitution of the United States says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That includes Christianity or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The founding fathers understood you couldn't have religious freedom in America and a Christian nation too. So that's why in a treaty begun by George Washington and signed by President Adams said that the government of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. The founding fathers did not have to tell our forefathers that America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Every slave in America knew that this country was not founded on the Christian religion. 
Every Native American knows Frederick Douglass said that the most devout Christians made the most savage slaveholders. As a matter of fact, because uh, it is not founded on the Christian religion, it's not a Christian nation, it's, it's, and, and because it is not a Christian nation, it's precisely why we have religious freedom. For as long as we have religious people and Christians, they will be fighting amongst themselves. One day the Lord said to me, my church has grown more by acrimony, dissension, and division than it has grown by evangelism. What do I mean by that? If you see more than one church of the same faith in the same city, it's usually because some got it, somebody got mad with somebody. Christians who are not Christ-like are a mean bunch. Have you ever attended a board meeting lately? I read a sign one day said, Lord, keep me, save me from the hands of an angry Christian. Without Christ-likeness, we can be an intolerant and dangerous bunch. As a matter of fact, can I tell you honestly, I feel safer amongst tolerant people. We have religious liberty because... Precisely because we are not a Christian nation. Too many Christians have what I call the spirit of Cain. You know what the spirit of Cain is? You know, they believe their worship is acceptable and right. And because they are right, they feel like Cain, that they have license to hurt and maim and undermine people who worship differently than they do. Someone once said, it is an easy step to hurt the body of one whose soul in your imagination you have already damned. First of all, brothers and sisters, a Christian nation is an oxymoron. It is a contradiction of terms. One of the greatest Christian leaders of our time said to me once, Wintley, America has never been a Christian nation. And more than America was meant to be a Christian nation, she was meant to be a nation of Christians, of Jews, of Muslims, of whomever, where all people can worship God according to the dictates of their conscience or not worship him at all if they so desire. And it's an oxymoron because, listen, only a person can be a Christian. You cannot baptize a tire shop or a Burger King franchise and make it a Christian business. Only a person can be a Christian. People who call America a Christian nation have selective historical memory. (laughs) They forget the slaughter of the Native Americans and the horrors of slavery. They forget that most of the founding fathers of this country were able to have a Bible in one hand and the chains of slaves in the other. Throughout this history of our country, we have had this epidemic of Christianity without the character of Christ. James Madison, if if you've ever heard that name, he was the architect of the principles of religious freedom that made it into the Constitution. That same James Madison owned hundreds of slaves and would not free them upon his death because that would mean his wife would not be able to live the lifestyle to which she had grown accustomed. The very man who used his genius to preserve religious freedom for generations could not see his own hypocrisy my God. And some of you have heard recently they discovered that in 1838 Georgetown University was about to close its doors. But the priests who ran Georgetown University were able to save the university by selling 272 of their slaves. That's how Georgetown University was saved. Can you tell me what Christians are doing owning slaves? But one thing James Madison got right, he was the one who had that language. 
Congress shall make no law. He understood that you cannot have a Christian nation and religious freedom at the same time. And let me tell you why. Can, you t- can I tell you, this is how Ellen White tells it. She said, persecution always follows religious favoritism on the part of secular governments. You cannot have religious freedom and a Christian nation too. Woo! Persecution always follows religious favoritism. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you before I I leave you that state power is a satanic gift to the church. In 1990, February the 8th, 1990, I landed in Johannesburg, South Africa. That's February 8th, 1990. February 9th, the next day, I was in the office of President F.W. de Klerk, the president of South Africa, who said to us, you've come a long way to tell us apartheid is wrong. But we want you to know you're now preaching to the choir. He said, we know it's wrong, but we need time, we need time. That's something oppressors always need time. The oppressed, they don't want to hear nothing about time. President F.W. de Klerk did not let on to us in that meeting that the next day he had a secret meeting with Nelson Mandela to inform him that the following day he was going before the press to announce that the day after that that he would be released from prison. So as a consequence, I was honored to be in the crowd that welcomed Nelson Mandela when he walked out of prison. Mr. Mandela had spent 27 years in prison. He literally suffered himself into power. But I want you to know what he dismantled, apartheid. Apartheid was a Dutch religious freedom, a Dutch religious teaching, a Dutch religious teaching. It was taken, the word apartheid means separateness. And it had at its foundation, thank you God, a misguided misinterpretation of Acts 17 verse 26. In this religious teaching and theology, they thought, they taught that even though God in Acts 17 26 said he made all nations of one blood. They taught, uh, you didn't read the second half of that verse. The second half of that verse says, he also has determined the bounds of their habitation. That biblical teaching meant to them that it was God's will that people of different colors and races were to be separated by geographic borders and boundaries. So in their official church magazine, the equivalent of our review, the Dutch Reformed Church called apartheid official church policy. The government then began to implement church. Are you listening to me? the government began to implement church policy. And under, and this is what it looked like. Under apartheid in South Africa, light-skinned blacks, also known as coloreds, could not live in the same town or city with dark-skinned blacks. 
There was even a department of government that handled the classification of race and color. And if you were living, God forbid, with the dark-skinned blacks and felt you were light-skinned enough to move to the light-skinned town that had better homes and schools, you could send into the government the most flattering picture of yourself. And if the government decided you were light-skinned enough to move from the black town to the light-skinned town, only then would you be allowed to move. And all this oppression and cruelty for 50 years was the result of the state enforcing a misguided religious teaching, religious beliefs, empowered and implemented by the state or persecuting persecuting power. In 1985, a group of black South African theologians wrote that this state theology is not only heretical, it is blasphemous. And the church cannot collaborate with tyranny. Now, I remember when we first traveled to South Africa during the days of apartheid, to travel freely as a black U.S. citizen, I was granted the status of an honorary white. Oh, do I look like one? I must have been in the Bible, too. But one of the most, and, and I share that to tell you this, one of the most touching, sobering, documents I have ever read in my entire ministry. One of the most sobering, touching documents I have ever read in my entire ministry is the confession of the Adventist Church of South Africa confessing publicly their failure to be a bold Christ-like voice standing up to apartheid. This confession was presented to Bishop Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It is so profound. It is so profound. Allow me to read a few sentences from this confessional statement. It reads, we confess that despite our zeal for the commandments of God, we failed to adequately contextualize just what the righteousness of God meant in practice in South Africa. We confess we were altogether too caught up with maintaining our traditional apolitical stance with regard to the separation of church and state that we effectively did not combat the viciousness of apartheid. We fail to realize that the state demanded of its citizens things to which it had no claim. And as Christians, we should have resisted this usurpation of God's authority to the utmost. We have to admit that we coveted security, peace, and quiet for ourselves with public respect and acceptance rather than risk raising the wrath of a state that was running amok with the exploitation of poor people and the enrichment and corruption of strong people. So we commit ourselves, therefore, once again to the denouncement of the Babylonian captivity of the church in which it sells its soul to the state and the articulation of a more effective and clear warning against the worship of the beast, that civil religious concoction of blasphemy, coercion, human arrogance, and injustice. When I read those words, I'm humbled, I'm inspired, because it is a modern cautionary tale that reminds us church alliances with the state are dangerous. Before I leave you, the time is coming in this country 
when God's people like the three Hebrew boys will be commanded to bow down to the church-state alliance this country will create. And like the three Hebrew boys, we will have to say, we will not bow down. We understand the consequences. We have already counted the cost. No need for negotiation or special consideration. When it comes to the worship of our God, we will not bow down. Nothing will cause us to vacillate or equivocate. Our position is firm. We will not bow to the idol of church, state, religion in America. And because God's people won't bow down to this church state idol, we will face the fires of persecution. And I believe we will see it in our lifetime. You see, the pendulum it keeps swinging. It's swinging from the church being persecuted, and it will swing back to the church doing the persecuting. We will see the church being the one placing others in the fires of persecution. I believe just as Nebuchadnezzar threatened those who would not bow down to the true God with death, we will have a church-state alliance here in America threatening people with persecution of death. Listen, Christians who are not Christ-like are a dangerous bunch. I believe the Christian church in this country will go from being a persecuted church to being a persecuting church. The church will use state power to persecute. Now, don't get me wrong. Can I say spoiler alert? When you sign up to be a Christian, you sign up to be persecuted. For all who will live godly in Christ, shall suffer. We are not to seek to avoid persecution by seeking to persecute others. Can I tell you why persecuting is more dangerous than being persecuted? Because when you are being persecuted, you can resemble and reflect the character of God. But you can't do that when you are doing the persecuting. God is telling me, pray. Bow your heads with me. When we are thrown into the fires of persecution, someone will say, look, we have a friend in the fire. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. We have a friend in the fire. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. We will have a friend in the fire. His robe is vestures dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. We will have a friend in the fire. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them. We have a friend in the fire. Are you ready to go through the fire? Are you ready to stand on the side 
of the persecuted church. If you are, you will have a friend in the fire. Dear God, some of us will feel like we're being burned up when you're just refining us in the fire. You let us stay in the fire until you see your reflection in us. Christ is longing to see himself perfectly reproduced in us. Are you ready to go through the fire? Remember, we have a friend in the fire. When the darkest is deepest, when we will be assailed by persecution, We have a friend in the fire. God, wake us up. Help us to prepare ourselves to stand undaunted. To stand committed. Lord, we're going to trust our souls to that friend who will take us through the fire. Is there anybody here today who wants to say, Lord, you've convicted me. I need to stop playing around. I need to get ready to face the fires of persecution. Father, give me the courage to go through the fire. If that's your prayer today, Lord, give me the courage to go through the fire of persecution. I invite you to to just raise your hand today and say, Lord, give me the courage to face the fires of persecution. If you have your hands raised, you mean it, you're sincere, stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. God, give me the courage to face the fires of persecution.